Can you guys hear me? Oh, thank you. And welcome to the first lightning talk of Cisco Live 23. Uh, the session is about the quantum security. A lot of talks about the quantum these days, even the small kids knows. Um, so my name is Vinay Saini. I'm principal architect with Cisco Customer Services. So what I primarily do is help customer design their networks. Uh, you know, it's SGA, IoT, and the security as well. So here is a quick agenda. So we have just 20 minutes. So I try to squeeze uh, so much stuff here. And given it's a quantum, it's very confusing, you know. First time when I started working on the quantum a few years back, everything just went ahead of, you know. And I have to unlearn so many things to understand uh, the basics of the quantum. So we'll start with the quantum computing basics, and then we delve into the quantum security, and finally about what Cisco is doing, what products we have today which supports quantum security. Now, my, I have a four-year-old son, and he was recently watching this Ant-Man Quantumania movie, and he heard me you know, preparing something on the quantum. He says, Dad, are you going to teach people how to become an Ant-Man? I say, no, <laughs> definitely no. So, so I'm not here to teach you the, the Spider-Man or the Ant-Man tricks, but definitely what uh, Cisco is planning uh, to tackle on the quantum adversaries. Uh, so I would request, please do rate this session, provide your feedback. That really matters for speakers like me. Let's get started. So what is the computing? You know, it all started with the computing when we talk about the quantum computers. Now, quantum computers came just now, and they are in, you know, very infancy state. They are like infants now. But then, computing is basically anything which can, you know, use for process information. And biological computers are our brains. We have been calculating from millions of years. And then we had these you know, mechanical devices, like what you can see here, Turing machine, a backers, and a lot of other stuff. And then finally, we have these computers. Now, for the rest of the session, I'll call them classical computers. Because quantum computers work on very different technology, and the way they process information is very different. So we have these supercomputers, classical computers. But everything, you know, slow, fast, super fast, everything, as long as they work on the transistors, they are classical computers. But then what is the need of a quantum computing, right? So the idea came from this gentleman, Richard uh, Feynman, and he was trying to do some kind of a simulation at the quantum level, you know? And then there are so many states a quantum system can go through that your classical computers cannot compute. And then these guys say, okay, in order to compute something which I'm doing at a quantum level, I need fundamentally very different way of calculations. And then say, why can't I use a mechanism which is based on the quantums, you know, those atoms, those ions, you know, which can calculate or simulate the environment which he wanted to do. And that's where the whole discussion started. You know, people actually started thinking about they need something different on the quantum computers. So even today, the quantum computers are very, very huge. You might have seen pictures like this on the internet. So they are very infancy states. You know, they can't do much what we are claiming today that they will be breaking encryption and all, but they will be soon. We are making a constant progress. And that's where companies like Cisco are getting ready and helping our customers to transition to a way where, you know, they can be secure against the quantum adversaries when they come. So we had initially these large vacuum tube-based computers, you know, like decades back. And today, if you compare, we are still in that infancy state. So what is a quantum computing, right? So quantum computing basically makes use of these quantum physics properties in order to do the calculations. And these are not the normal mathematical calculations where quantum computers will be used. These will be more on the probability. You know, how do you answer something based on the probabilistic approach sort of a thing? And this is, this is most confusing, right? When I talk, when I take sessions on the quantum computing, many people tend to think that these are the next generation and the faster version of and the CPU-based computers, but not. So they are fundamentally very different breed of the computing, and they primarily use concepts like superposition and entanglement as their base of the calculations. And similar to the bit, we have a very fundamental uh, qubit, which is used for calculation in the quantum computers. So a difference between a bit and a qubit is there. Your bit could have only two states, like 0 and 1. But in quantum, you can have infinite number of states because 
your ion or atom could be somewhere in between the states of zero and one. And this concept we call as the superposition. And what you see a small equation here, you know, uh, 0 0.8 and 0.6, those are the probability amplitudes of having that specific qubit degree of zero or degree of one. And the problem, one of the problem today is, you know, why don't we have the lot of super fast quantum computers about the qubits? It's very difficult to make these qubits. These qubits are made from the atoms, you know, or the electron spins or the nuclear spins or the trapped ions sort of a thing. But most of the supercomputers today, uh, you know, which companies are making are based on the superconducting qubits. So these are the man-made things. You have those superconducting materials and then you have an insulator in between them and they act as an artificial atom. So what it means that, you know, if some aliens are seeing from the space and say, oh, humans are really making some progress because they have created artificial atoms. And sorry about the picture, I had to hand draw that because of the copyright issues. Um, I hope uh, aliens don't get, get angry with me. So the whole superposition concept makes our calculations super fast because now you can have the multiple number of calculations going in parallel. And the beauty of this is you say that, you know, when, when I'm saying that a quantum uh, a qubit could be in a different state, it is as long as you don't observe it. The moment you observe it, it will go into one of the discrete states, which is zero and one. A very different concept from the classical computing. And uh, since this is a very small session, I would recommend, you know, if you kind of uh, uh, look at these concepts uh, later on. But if you look at the power of quantum computers here is, now you have two bits, you can have only four states. But if you have the qubit-based concept, you can have two raised to power n states at the same time. And that's why the quantum computers are so fast. Another important concept is the quantum entanglement. So you can entangle two qubits in a way that you can predict the behavior of a second one if you know the behavior of the first one. So in this case, if I have two entangled qubits, red and green here, so if I know that one is red, then second definitely will be green. And the amazing thing is distance doesn't matter. They work at subatomic level, and even if you take them to different planets or galaxies, they will still behave the same. And that's where if you Google, there is a conspiracy theory. Is there something faster than light? How these qubits are kind of communicating with each other, right? And the easy way to understand uh, this whole entanglement is my wife comes up and shows me which dress I should wear, red or green. I say red, then she says, okay, I'll wear green one. <laughs> you know, so me and my wife are entangled. So I see some, some smiling faces. So yeah, I think you guys are also entangled in that way. So moving into the next phase, we are doing the classical computing based on these gates, right? Not gates, AND gates, and the OR gates. Similarly, in the quantum computing, we have so many gates, so I just kept very few here. So we have one qubit operations, for example, I gate, X gate, or H gate. H gate is important, Hadamard gate, because you use this gate to put a, a, a qubit into a quantum state, or into superposition state, sorry. And then there are two qubit operations. So this is uh, slightly different from our classical NOT gate. So it's a control bit which decides whether the second qubit will be 0 or 1. And this is also a very important gate if you're doing a, a, a computing which is based on the quantum computers because this gate is used uh, to put a qubit into the Bell state, uh, which is an uh, entangled state. So what it means that if my first bit is zero, I don't change this state. It's zero, it means it remains zero. If it's one, it remains one. But if my control bit is one, then I flip that. So it's, imagine that entanglement concept we were talking about. And the end goal of all this thing is we have to make a quantum circuit, right? And that's where the more scary thing comes. So there are researchers, there are scientists who have created these algorithms which can crack today's encryption you know, which can do the faster computing when compared to the classical computers. Now let's move on to the why there is so much care about the quantum computers, right? Everybody is worried about, so uh, we have, uh, Cisco has a lot of customers coming from uh, defense, finance, uh, I believe some of you might be there. Because even though we don't have the quantum computers yet, you can store a data between two computers 
And once the quantum computer comes, you can break them that time. And many of the uh, government agencies, they have this obligation that they have to keep the information secret for next 50 years or 100 years, but then they are worried, you know, if somebody captures today and down the line 20 years, if the quantum computers comes, they can easily break uh, uh, that encryption. And the primary reason how this work is because of the Shores algorithm. So today, most of the encryption, uh, Diffie-Hellman or the other encryption, or um, any kind of a, this is based on the prime numbers multiplication, right? And as of today, it was very difficult. You multiply two prime numbers of you know, enough uh, strength, and then it's very difficult to get uh, the actual numbers which you have multiplied. But quantum computers changes that. So there is a gentleman called Peter Shore. You will see uh, some of his lectures on the YouTube and uh, other places. So what he has done is he came up with an algorithm with the concepts what we discussed, you know, those entanglement and using those quantum gates, Hadamard gates. He made a circuit which can break that in a polynomial time. So initially with the classical computer, what was taking hundreds of years, now once the quantum computers are ready with the enough qubits, you can break in a few hours, right? So. Basically, a quantum computer can solve your Diffie-Hellman or elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman in the polynomial time. From exponential, we can we have reduced the problem to a polynomial time. And the impact of that is any encryption what we use today in our VPNs, in IPsec or MacSec, because they are based on asymmetric cryptography. And the problem with that is quantum computers can break them. Now, uh, the good thing at the same time is if any of these are based on the symmetric keys, quantum computers cannot break that, right? Symmetric keys means that you need to encode the both end of the router as, let's take an example, site A and B, and you are creating an IPsec tunnel between them. So both the side, you have to send the same key. But then even if you send, somebody can break, right? So that's again the problem. How do I send immediately the key on the both end of sides? So that's where there is a concept of quantum key distribution. So quantum key distribution, again, it doesn't use the classical internet to synchronize the keys on the both ends. So there is a concept where I'm using the quantum channel to send the basic seed of the key, and both end can calculate that. So today, so there are a lot of QKD vendors, if you look at, they provide you this quantum-based entropy or the keys. And the reason it works is, if anybody tries to see or snoop into that, the quantum state vanishes. And you know that there is something really wrong and we will not use the key. So this is again a huge topic. Uh, I can talk hours on this, but uh, the idea here is there is something, a concept called quantum key distribution. Cisco has a lot of uh, uh, vendors who support QKD. And next we would go and talk about how you can integrate these QKD vendors with Cisco devices. Now, there are two actually ways how do you protect your IPsec tunnels and your other encryptions using uh, uh, the quantum. So one is the quantum safe cryptography. So it basically talks about the mechanisms which you can, for example, QKD, right? Something which is for the quantum. And the second way is the post-quantum cryptography. You will see these terms you know, on the internet or Cisco websites so often that you have to use something called pre-shared key because pre-shared key cannot be broken by the quantum computers. And what Cisco is using, specific RFC, you can make a note of that, RFC 8784, which talks about how do you mix the pre-shared keys with the existing algorithms. Because it takes time to adopt a new algorithm. NIST is already working on you know, finalizing some algorithms for, but till then, how do you secure that? Because our customers need this solution today. So first thing is, if you have an IO sexy and you are using an IPsec tunnel, we already have this feature available, which enables the quantum safe IPsec tunnels on IUSXE. And there are three ways you can do that. You know, some of our customers say, I just want to try how it works. In that case, we have a manually configured PPKs. So you, <clears throat> so you go into the CLI, and we have another set of configuration. And if any of you are interested, after this session, I can share you some sample configurations. So you configure on the both of the sides these manual keys. Those are mixed using the RFC 8784, and then your quantum resistance is enabled. But then some of our other customers say, no, I really want that QKD mechanism with the QKD devices. So Cisco has come up with a new protocol. Uh, we call it uh, SKIP, 
secure key integration protocol and somewhere you also see session key integration protocol. So what it allows is, so if you have any QKD vendors, right? You have those vendors, they have these devices which can, under, which can do entanglement, which can do all this superposition and send the keys. You can integrate the Cisco IOS XE routers with them and we can import the keys. And we use that in order to create a quantum resistant IPsec tunnel. The last one is more on the trial. This is like a software base. If you really don't have uh, um, integration with the QKD, you can, you want to try out, we have a, a software which we can use in order to uh, kind of a try this out. So there are different platforms, it's very easy. As long as you have a VM, you can download this 8000V. I myself tried it a couple of times with the different combinations here, and uh, you will see a quantum resistance enabled on uh, these devices. So primarily, you need a software version 17.11 onwards and any of these routers. So it works as of today. It works with the Flex VPN and DM VPN. Get VPN, we are working on that. Now, this is important. I mean, when talking about the session, mentions a bit about APIs. So how do we integrate with the QKD devices is using the Skip protocol, which is based on the APIs. If you, um, you know, know any of the vendors who wants to integrate with Cisco or you have a, uh, any QKD vendor, you can get in touch with Cisco and you can share how the whole uh, Skip integration uh, could be implemented on that. So the primary condition is you need to support a Skip protocol it's a secure protocol which allows the importing of those keys either from the QKD or even the entropy generators on the cloud. And many of these uh, QKD vendors, they have uh, entropy as a service. So they provide you these keys or random entropy over the cloud. So it's an HTTP based protocol and allows integration with any of the QKD vendors. And this is something what you see. So if you have the quantum and all the configuration done, you will see the quantum resistance enabled on your IPsec tunnels. And we have recently, so I think last week we published a configuration guide for iOS XE, which uh, tells you what configuration you have to do in order to enable this quantum resistance on your iOS XE devices. Uh, another one is on the iOS XR. We support that for the MacSec. Very similar concept, you need to, you have three options. Now these options work slightly different when we come to the iOS XR. You have the PSK. Now this PSK is not RFC uh, 8784. This is a very legacy feature. It was there from the day one. So if you configure the manual PSKs, your connection, max connection is uh, quantum resistance. The second one is, I was talking about the software server we were talking, you know, you have to install in the iOS X is separate, but iOS XR has inbuilt that software server or entropy generator. So you could try that right on these devices and internally it will communicate using the skip APIs and you have that entropy there. The last one is again same, any of the QKD vendors you have, you can integrate over the cloud or on-prem so primarily, you know, the idea, the basic concept is you don't use anything on the cloud. So today, when we talk about QKD, the best way to secure your infra is these QKD devices have to be co-located with your routers, right? And that's how a different uh, government agencies and defense agencies are using this. And these are some of the, the APIs uh, which we are using in order to get this information collected from these QKD vendors or the entropy generators. So you get that information and then use that, and the, the code is written in this, in this way, right? You use that entropy and then mix that with your, uh, the regular mechanisms what we have to make it more quantum resistant. So all these uh, uh, API based uh, keys are also supported there. And it's, uh, if, if you want to try this, iOS X is the simplest method. You can download the 8000V and then easy, easily simulate uh, this in the lab environment. And this is a queue catch, uh, fetching flow, what we have. So if you look at this SK engine, this is inbuilt in the Cisco router. It's not something, a uh, separate entity which you have to think about. This is just for uh, the purpose of showing how the system works. We have an SKS engine built inside the iOS XR routers, and then they use the APIs, which we uh, talking about in the previous slide, and collect that information and use that for creating those MACSEC uh, encryption there. So 
as of today, in summary, we have IPsec supported on iOS uh, XE and the MacSec for iOS XR. And many of our customers and the QKD vendors are trying that uh, and testing that in their scenarios. And we have uh, many of the customers who are actually trying of testing in the limited environments their secure IPsec-based VPNs uh, in their environment. So that's what we are almost over. Four, three, two, one. Time. I'm right on time. So thank you so much for joining. I would request please read this session. That really means uh, a lot uh, for speakers like this. And uh, there are some other sessions um, which talks about the overall security of these platforms like iOS X and XR. And I believe there also they'll talk a little bit about the quantum. So thank you so much again. Thank you so much for your time. Enjoy the rest of your Cisco life. Thank you.